I think this is one of my favorite sagas so far. I have a lot of thoughts, so let's just jump into it. All right, so Jaya ends by launching ourselves all the way up the knockup stream and finding the White Sea, which interestingly enough, there are like alternative routes to getting here besides the knockup stream, which sure, I guess that makes sense. There was uh, island hopping, which I assume is like hopping from like one cloud to another. The Sky Knight also mentioned the like peak of High West Mountain, which I assume is just like some random really tall mountain that maybe goes all the way up to the clouds. And so you just ride your ship there, kind of like reverse mountain. You kind of like ride your ship up the mountain into the clouds and that's how you get up there. But also, I mean, come on, they must be pretty rare if everyone's like, I don't, I don't know what that route is. I've never heard of it. People didn't even believe in a sky island, let alone knew that there were alternative routes. Like, it was, it was hinted at that there isn't just, like, one sky island here. There are multiple sky islands. Like, an Eru just existed in their, like, own island separated from Skypea. It's a totally different place. But, I mean, the interesting thing for me is that the sky ocean isn't just, like, this one small area that encompasses Skypea. It's, like, this entirely new continent with its own countries. Like, Skypea has its own intricate ecosystem in which everything is designed to just live up there in the clouds. Everything is, like, lighter and poofier or is able to, like, have wings and be really flat. So I think it's a situation where One Piece can really thrive, where they create a sort of, like, pseudo-episodic series. Where you have, like, yes, an overarching plot and a lot of the things that happen in these stories are relevant to the plot. But it's also just episodic enough to let the crew go to a random island and, like, oh, this island is now made out of, like, cheese. Does that make any sense? <laughs> it's episodic in nature to allow the crew to go practically anywhere and see practically anything with enough absurdism to showcase a world that is very strange and yet have enough mechanical component to make it feel cohesive. The concept of Skypea is weird, <laughs> but it is a cohesive weird. It is a weird that makes sense. There's a lot of mechanical structures in the White Sea that are very reminiscent of things that we've seen in the Blue Sea, like the shellfish that records and reproduces audio that's very similar to the snail that's also sound-based that works as a phone to communicate. Okay, so I mentioned that One Piece feels like a long-running series that can be episodic. It can have these like long overarching narratives, which then have like a more self-contained narrative within that larger narrative. In the case of Skypea, it happens twice. There's the like One Piece narrative, there's the Skypea narrative, and then there's like the Nolan narrative. It's not like in its own like isolated bubble. It reverberates outwards into the rest of the story. Nolan's story reverberates into Luffy's story, which then reverberates into reverberates how huh? like the bell ha, huh? um, <laughs> which then reverberates. Uh, that might not even be a word reverberate be repeated several times as an echo got it as it reverberates through the entire narrative from nolan to luffy to cricket to bellamy so when i was reviewing part one of like skypea which is jaya i mentioned that like nolan's narrative is sad but here it is it is like an extra layer of sad when you realize the complexity of the situation like, not only did Nolan go to this location and have to navigate through this complex societal structure, but here Nolan was like, hey, look, I just want to, like, study plants is all, and also I think that you killing each other is pretty weird. And so I just think it's, like, very beautiful that Nolan was able to identify the, the circumstances that were happening in, in Jaya. Is this called Jaya? Is this Jaya or Skypea? I don't really know what to call this chunk of land. I'm going to call it Land Pia. I'm going to call it Land Pia when it's on the land and connected to Jaya. I think that makes sense. And we're able to see like the actual benefits of collaboration and gaining information from each other and exploring different facets of the world. So I think Skypea does a lot of things amazingly well in this regard where it sets up a lot of questions that aren't fully explained only for them to be explained later on. As we see when like the crew is exploring the upper yard and they see like the remaining half of Nolan's house, and then the pieces just connect 
To me, it is like one of the most satisfying connections I think I've seen. That's the moment where it clicks and you connect the dots and you're like, wait a second. The island didn't go down. It went up. In Jaya, we see half of the house with a very extravagant, just like front exterior. And you know, at the time, I thought that was extremely uh, thematically relevant to, to Nolan's story. You know, they're a character who went on all of these adventures and had all of these amazing stories, but had a nothing to back it up, which is like thematically resonant when you show this building, which has like an amazingly extravagant exterior at the front, but ultimately just have like nothing to support it. But now the context is just like reshuffled and spun around as like we see that like this house wasn't just a house for show. It wasn't just like there to be there. The other half wasn't just like not built on purpose. It was just up in the sky it was somewhere else like i guess some people would have connected the dots all right i didn't i have to reread stuff like three times to even understand what it means the first time skypea just conceptually is extremely complicated like first off it used to be part of jaya so skypea used to be like land pia before it got up into the air land pia gets launched up into Skypea, and now it just becomes this extremely just political situation where the island people, you know, take Skypea over, and then a new ruler is instated, the new Kami, and then the new Kami is in a situation where, like, the people of the Sky Island already just use the upper yard so much that they need it to survive to the point where it becomes, like, a very hostile situation to negotiate the land back. All because the people of Skypea just want to ring the bell. And that makes sense. The people of the Sky Islands that took over Skypea are blocking and not allowing the people of Skypea to ring the bell, which is like this extremely important both like literal and spiritual tradition. And then you just like slap a Nehru that just comes in and now makes an entirely new problem. There was already so much conflict in Skypea versus the people of the Sky Island and a Nehru just comes in and just makes a new problem. The crew is essentially charged what, like something like 30 million initially to enter Skypea. <laughs> it's like they're already pirates. I, they, I don't think they're going to pay the 30 million fee. I don't think they're going to pay the 70 million fee. We never got to see what an X stolt looks like either. I'm just going to design it. I, <laughs> I'm just going to design my own. Okay, an X stolt is like a coin and it has like an angel wing. And that's what an X stolt is. Okay, so in Skypea, there is an arrow. Right? But Aneru is sort of this like self-obsessed ruler who has been planning something out for like what, six years or something like that? And what is up with all of these villains who have been planning something for years? They have, they have had their long scheming plans building up for years for their hard work to finally be paid off within like five days of the crew showing up. And like the crew just like shows up and just destroys all of their plans. Look, I know that it's only happened three times. That like three times a person has schemed their way into this like overly complicated plot in which they're gonna do something which ultimately just like gets destroyed. But it's weird that it happens three times. At some point, at some point people try to stop them and Aneru is just like, you know what? I'm gonna give you five minutes to try to kill me and I won't do anything. If a villain says I won't do anything, try to kill me, it's like maybe you should just give up at that point. All right, so Aneru's rule essentially structured it so if a citizen of Skypea knows that somebody is a criminal and doesn't punish them, they're killed. And one of the things that I liked is that Konus is coerced into helping Aneru by, like, backstabbing the crew into essentially sending them to their death. And you can tell she is, like, absolutely guilt-ridden. But Luffy can just, like, sense their body language. It's like, they're being, they're being weird. And like the entire crew, upon realizing that they have been trapped, that they have been like backstabbed, their like first instinct isn't like to get upset, but rather this nuanced reassurance for the safety of other people. It's like they realize they're backstabbed, they gave reassurance for the safety of others, and then when they realized there was a threat, they tried to save them. I think like a Nehru has been one of the most threatening villains not only because it was impossible for almost everyone to deal damage to him but because he also was the only one who took out so much of the crew including Zoro and when Luffy goes ahead and finds Zoro they're like what happened 
normally the situation so far has been like, if Zoro is there, then for the most part, you're going to be fine. I mean, that wasn't the situation on Little Garden, but you get the point. <laughs> but you get the point. Whenever they got into danger and half the crew was split, as long as like Zoro was there, they were going to be fine. That's not the case anymore. And like one of the most heartbreaking things I think for me was having to witness Nami just see all of their crew get taken out and when confronted with that same situation had to resort to swapping sides which is something that she used to do a lot during Orange Town for example and more specifically Arlong Park where they would play along and be friendly towards these like villainous people. And you can just see that like stress and worry come back as they like play along just trying to make it out okay. Like I, I can't imagine the, the psychological pain that would come from leaving one of those situations with Arlong only to fall back into it with Aneru. Which is why I was so excited when Luffy finally showed up. And then it just becomes like this like electricity versus rubber kind of fight where Neru is just using as much electricity as possible against Luffy, but they are just unable to do anything from the rubber ability. It's like very thematically relevant that like Luffy is just like this force to be reckoned with. And you know, even though they're fighting, it's not really about the fight in this situation as much as it's Luffy's attempt to ring the bell. Because Luffy ringing the bell would just reverberate throughout the story. It would go from like Nolan to Luffy to Cricket to like Bellamy. And so just seeing like Luffy actually ring the bell and it reverberates through everybody and everyone's able to see it along with a sun hitting Luffy, which then projects onto the clouds, making this like amazing silhouette in the sky. It's like that is an iconic moment. I like that after the fight, after all the damage has happened, after the bell has been rung, it's still not all clear. It's kind of like an Alabasta situation where it's like, yeah, you defeated the bad guy, but also, wow, it's like maybe, wow, that we got a lot of cleaning up to do. The entire Cloud Island is gone. Everybody has to like learn how to thrive together in Skypea in the upper yard, the only part that survived. And hopefully over time, that gets addressed. Like that's done. A lot of that's behind us. We're like officially in the clear now. And so they do end it with like a little dance. And it's so happy. Even like the wolves are like dancing. And even though the island and all the people there as a whole have a lot to go through still, it's a situation where the crew has done their job. They explored a new island. They defeated the big bad. They saw the potoglyph. We even see like Goldie Rogers' uh, signature, which is like just an amazing, just mind-twisting detail that is just thrown in there. Like, ah, yeah, you know, they all write their signatures on the end. It's like a tourist destination. Now, the only thing left for them to do is just leave. Throughout the entire saga, they've had a question of, how do we get down from here? And they leave none other than with a giant octopus that slowly floats down to the bottom. That's amazing. Dimension. You don't think this is another time warp, do you? Maybe this time the sky is just falling. <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on. That's what ha That's the end? That's the end of the four kids version? They just all die. <laughs> they, they just all die. 